Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, based on which part of the world you're tuning from. Welcome to this ICOM webinar on new challenges for collection and storage areas. My name is Vinod Daniel. I'm a board member of ICOM, and it's my privilege to moderate this panel discussion. As many of you are aware, most collecting institutions around the world have most of their collections in storage rather than in display. In many institutions, collections in storage can be 90 to 99% of the total collections. The importance of protecting storage areas and collections has been challenging and has always been a delicate balance between risks and budgets, as well as between access and maintenance. ICOM as an organization has always been involved in the challenges facing contemporary museums and because of the importance of this aspect has chosen this topic for today's webinar. This webinar among many issues will focus on best practices in collection preservation, access to collections in storage, risk management for collections, etc. I am really delighted that we have four eminent professionals in the museum field in this panel. Mr. Keita Dauda, Ms. Silvana Di Lorenzo, Ms. Anna Bulo, and Mr. Aristoteles Georgios Sakararua. In a brief while, I'll introduce them with a short bio. For those who are watching us, on Yuka TV, the webinar will be streamlined with simultaneous translation in French, English, and Spanish. And before I start um, the, the, the panel discussion, on behalf of ICOM, I really want to thank the support of the French Ministry of Culture for the development of this series of seminars. Also, before closing, I'll make a small announcement where we'll have two questions on your chat box where we'll invite people to fill in uh, as, as a short survey. Now, let me introduce um, uh, the, the panel. I am I'm extremely delighted that we have such an eminent group of people here joining us. Um, Mr. Keita Dauda is the Director General of the National Museum of Mali and Professor at the University of Social Sciences and Administration at Bamako. He's one of the initiators of the Cultural Banks project in Mali and participates in the fight against looting of archaeological sites and the illicit sale of cultural goods through, the, through information sharing, awareness raising, and training of local communities. Silvana Di Lorenzo, she's a conservator at the Ethnographic Museum and professor of anthropological sciences at the University of Buenos Aires. She did a master's in conservation and restoration of artistic and bibliographic works at the National University of San Martin. Silvana is a professor of anthropology at, Bu at Buenos Aires University. Anna Bolo is a head of collection management at the Stedelijk Museum in Amsterdam. She has specialized in preventive conservation and the management of collections. She graduated with a Master of Art Conservation degree from the University of Queens in Canada in 1998 and completed a doctorate at D. Montour University in Leicester, UK. She's been head of preservation at the UK National Archives until 2012 and head of conservation at the British Museum until 2019. Aristoteles Georgios Sakalaro has worked for the Qatar Museum since 2012 and he's currently the head of conservation based at the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha. Previously, he was a head of conservation and scientific research at the Islamic Arts Museum in, in Malaysia. He has also been a consultant for a series of projects in the Eastern Mediterranean and the UK and for the University of Athens, the Hellenic Museum of Folk Folklore Art. He did masters in museums management in 2012 and master's in preventive conservation 2007 from Northumbria North University. The format for today's discussion would be as follows. I'm going to invite each panelist to speak for four minutes, after which I'll open it up with a few questions 
from me and I'll follow that up with some questions from the audience. So as the panelists are speaking, I kindly request the audience, please type in your questions and, and there'll be somebody who'll collect it and pass that on to me. Um, again, simultaneous translation is available in three languages, English, French, and Spanish. Now over to the panelists, the speaking order would be, um, Kita would start with uh, uh, her first opening comments for four minutes, followed by Silvana, then Anna, then Aristo. Over to you, Kita. Merci, monsieur. Uh, Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I am delighted to participate in this webinar. The speaker sound seems to be mute. Okay, so I am delighted to participate in this meeting and to be able to expose the problems that we have to face in Mali because of the health crisis. The health crisis has exacerbated the pre-existing issues in museums around the world and more specifically in Mali. All the experienced curators of the museums in Mali have retired a few years ago. So that's a problem for us because the new people in charge lack the experience they need to properly ensure the conservation of our collections. So our conservation work has had to stop because of the pandemic. And we need experienced workers to ensure their mission. Moreover, we are the victims of unpredictable blackouts, which also damage our collections. Two museums are currently experiencing power issues. You know that in Mali, it's very hot, so the heat might damage the collections. In the wet season, we also have issues with the infiltration of rainwater in museums, which can deteriorate the collections. Our measuring instruments that measure the temperature don't always work very well because of that humidity. So, on top of all of this, the institutional, political, social crisis and the, the health crisis have exacerbated our problems. So, we need cooperation more than ever. We need people, experts, to visit our museums. In the circumstances, we decided to act as far as we could to protect the population. We tried to respect the measures that were announced by the government to ensure the safety of our staff. So it's hard to work in museums right now. However, we keep working. For instance, in our storage areas, we chose certain certain collections to organize an exhibition for the 60 years of Mali, 60th anniversary at the National Museum. So in spite of our staff shortages, we keep working as hard as we can in order to maintain our activities at the National Museum. Moreover, we have a cleaning service that ensures the clean 
the cleanliness of the museum and the surrounding area. And we try to maintain a monitoring of our paintings and objects that are exposed so that the conservation state of those objects is constantly assessed. We also released a few video clips to show the actual state of our objects in the rooms and in the storage areas. We have hit, been hit very hard by the current crisis. However, we do not give up. We try to do our best to maintain the physical integrity of our objects. Although it is hard to expose those objects to the public, we try to preserve them. So we have a training problem, we have a um, expert staff shortage, and we also need products to be able to manage pests and the deterioration due to climate. So those are the problems that we have to face. Thank you. Thank you so much. Can I now request um, Silvana to make your opening comments, please? Good morning, good afternoon. First, I'd like to thank you for having invited me. Thanks to ICON Paris. For me, it's a pleasure to be with you here in the morning in Argentina. First, I'd like to say that in Argentina, as in many other countries in Latin America, the situation created by COVID-19 is extremely difficult. Particularly in Argentina, we have been under restrictions for six months already. So from an economic point of view, it's very difficult nonetheless. And that has had a major impact on our profession. Poverty is on the rise as well in Argentina. So against that framework, when it comes to museum and when it comes to museums, depending on universities, as is my case, most museums are closed to the public. And that posed its own problems. The Buenos Aires University handles several uh, museums, such as the Juan Bautista Ethnographic Museum, which is the only one with its own building, with its own premises. That uh, could have allowed us to conduct uh, regular inspections after the first month of closure. But one of the major problems in our museum, as in many other museums, is that we don't have controlled environments. There's no environmental control regarding the collections if we don't have staff, in-person staff. So we need to undertake a lot of paperwork with the museum authorities, with the university, for them to understand that we needed to go physically to the museum in order to monitor the collections and to conduct environmental controls. Our museum is located in an old building from the 19th century. The building was not built as a museum. It was the first faculty of law belonging to the University of Buenos Aires. So the museum had to be adapted to new conditions to display the collection. When, it, when we had a normal life, so to speak, the different areas displaying collections, the ethnographic uh, reserve, the archives, the biologic anthropological section, the library, which hosts uh, really interesting uh, objects uh, regarding old anthropology. All that was served by staff who were fully qualified in terms of prevention and conservation of collections. 
and staff used to conduct lots of uh, measures for preventive conservation of collections and we were in charge as well of conducting all necessary inspection and monitoring to ensure that the collections were in perfect state very few collections are really on display that's an issue as well i think we should monitor what we can see we could inspect what we have on display but that's the easy part because the big part of collections are actually in storage areas are not on display they're in drawers they're in cupboards in wardrobes on shelves and we need people going there to see for themselves the status of those collections Recently, we were granted permission to send three people, you can imagine, three people to supervise over 100,000 objects within the museum. We have a beautiful garden, we have a courtyard, which needs to be uh, preserved as well. As I said, I referred to environmental control, preservation, to make sure that uh, storms or weather events do not have a negative impact on the collection. So with all with those three people, we can only conduct a minimum measures to make sure, for instance, that the leaves falling from big trees in the courtyard uh, to prevent those leaves from blocking the pipes, for instance. So that's the situation. And I agree with Ted Seymour, who advocated for weathering the storm, because that's what we have to go through at the moment. That's what's under discussion at the moment as well. And we're dealing with the authorities to make sure that we have the right protocols in place to conduct our work safely. I'd like to add that the Buenos Aires University came up with the only resolution pertaining museums, and that only goes to close down museums to the public. Apart from that, they came up at the university with the general protocols for safety and occupational safety measures, but nothing specific for museums. Through the University Museums Network, we are a member of such network, we drafted a protocol and a series of recommendations based on international protocols already in place, including uh, measures as well prescribed by the health ministry in our country. And that's the protocol we're actually following. Also, as Ted Seymour said, from the UK Conservation Institute, he said that we need to awake collections, we need to wake collections up. And that means we need to prioritize actions and to anticipate risks pertaining these collections. That's precisely what we're doing at the moment. And we're trying to have staff members who oversee collections. We're trying to get them back to the museums, always in the safest possible environment, of course. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much, Silvana. Uh, could I now invite Anna to make your opening comments, please? Yeah, certainly. Um, good morning, good afternoon, God, and good evening to everyone. Um, and thank you for ICOM to ICOM for inviting me along to this um, webinar. Um, I feel really quite lucky following the two previous speakers because I feel that the situation for me in Northern Europe is really quite different, um, although we are dealing with the same issues. But first of all, I want to basically um, observe that all my professional life, I have had thoughts around disaster planning and how would I do things and how would it happen and now for the first time I really experienced a real big disaster and my first my first reaction is that this disaster has nothing to do with the objects because the objects are actually fine so that that it is it's a completely different thing that I'm experiencing so for us in the Netherlands um, our museum 
closed on the 12th of March. And that for us was just the evening. And I can and I can I step in just if you can speak a bit slower. I think the interpreters are doing at the same time. So okay. Um, so we closed on the twelfth of March, and that was uh, just on the evening before opening a major exhibition of which we hoped it would be the the best and and biggest exhibition for us of the year. So it was very unfortunate, and. Um, within the directorate, we had a bit of a sense of panic for this. We obviously had never experienced anything like this. My first thoughts were, we need to switch off the lights in the museums and we have to uh, put the air conditioning on nightstand and we need to maintain the security throughout the building. But then my second thoughts were that, and we are a contemporary museum, we had um, as part of an installation, a whole room full of live plants and they were special plants because they were supposed to be pest free. And we need to keep, we needed to keep them alive because we didn't really know how long would it take for us to, to, to stay closed. So that meant we needed to make sure that we uh, water those plants. And of course, my second, second thoughts also involved that we can't just close up the museum we have to also look at um, what is happening and look at the collection itself. So within collection management, I nominated one member of my team who basically knew the museum building very well, including the basements and also our storage really well. Um, and I nominated him to basically come to both locations every day and look into every room and just make sure that there's nothing that uh, we shouldn't know about. And he would also be the one that waters the plants. And that went well, um, but we later decided actually that we can reduce that frequency of checks to three times a week, because in real life, I realized we also don't go into absolutely every room every day. So we reduced it. And um, we also uh, made sure, or he made sure that um, all the rubbish was cleared out of all the locations. And he was also in touch with the city of Amsterdam to make sure that they don't uh, come and try and collect rubbish where we don't produce any anymore. So those were basically the, the, the second thoughts that happened within, let's say the first two days. And then my third, thoughts or my third realization was that within just a week, all our planned loans around the world were out of sync. So either they could not be taken any longer, they were not required any longer, or they were wanted, but we couldn't serve them because we had closed the museum and all operations. Or they were due to return, but there were no flights any longer. So for example, we had one very valuable painting that was in Japan and it was supposed to come back to us to Amsterdam in order to go further to Chicago and the idea and we couldn't get it back to Amsterdam and then questions arise as to what do you do do you leave it is it insured who is liable for this Naya. Yeah. so I don't want to go into further details but this kept the registrars really busy administrating a schedule that had completely gotten out of sync. And of course, while all of this is going on, our first concerns remained for the staff themselves. Were they all okay? Was there anyone sick? Could they work from home? If not, is there anything that we could do as an employer to help them work from the home? Some of them had care duties towards children would they have to take public transport if they did come to the museum? So those were all questions they went on on a kind of management level. And of course, staff also got sick. So the question was, how do we go further with how many people? And what if more people became ill? So overall, I would say I've, I found that quite stressful just to manage all of this. But I also want to say that I like to think that this time was also a chance for us because first of all, we realized that we didn't have good control of our lighting. 
So not enough people actually knew how to operate it, which meant the idea of switching the lights was good. Switching the lights off was good, but we didn't really know how to. And um, some of it we realized we had outsourced and some of it we do ourselves. And to just really make sure that we all knew basically how to switch lights on and off took us three weeks. And that is probably time that we wouldn't have otherwise dedicated to something like this. But now that we are in control of our lights throughout the entire building, it also means that we can save energy and we can be much more flexible in its use. So that is another positive uh, point for me. And really we had a similar issue with the time-based media that run with computers or, or lights or similar. And um, we had similar issues with switching them on and off and who could do this, who's qualified to do this. And um, we have since then come up with with trying to share the expertise more widely and try to upgrade so that we can also do these things remotely. And then thirdly, the third positive point for me was that we involuntarily starved out our resident rodent population because all cafes, restaurants and the staff canteen were closed. So there was no food and it was actually quite quick that we started to find uh, dead rodents so that was also a positive, unexpected uh, um, result. And um, overall, this going back to the remote, remote or better control of, of our lighting and also the time-based media meant that we, are, we were much more flexible in terms of how, how we used it and very quickly um, we started preparing for online activities, online blogs or vlogs. And for that, we needed to switch the lights off or particular parts of the exhibition um, on again. And so we got much better at this. And this is also something that we are still benefiting from. So as a museum, we opened to the public again on the 1st of June. Um, and overall, yes, things could have gotten off, gone better, but I'm overall happy with how it went, even if it was quite stressful. And, um, and I think that our collections in our case, and again, I realize how lucky we are, but I think overall our collections actually benefited because they were kept darker and cooler during this time and there was less movement of them. So, so far for now. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, before Aristo starts, um, can I request uh, the audiences, the participants to just type in your questions and, and please send that over. Uh, we'll get an opportunity to, to ask the questions to the panelists. Aristo. I would like to send my greetings to all the participants, all the people who are uh, listening to me right now, and they also thank you, ICOM, for the invitation. Uh, and it has been super interesting to hear the other three panel panelists, Mr. Kito, Silvana, and Anna. Um, I think our case is a little bit closer to the third one in terms of uh, uh, how people were moving. So, uh, this is Aristo. I work for Qatar Museums. Qatar Museums is an umbrella organization that is responsible for six museums in Qatar, uh, all the public art, so big sculptures outdoors, and also archaeology in Qatar. We are uh, responsible for uh, each one of these aspects. Uh, personally, I'm based at the Museum of Islamic Art. Uh, it is a signature building for the, for the country. Uh, when you hear Qatar, most likely you'll see our museums in, adver in advertisements, in uh, uh, all sorts of uh, merchandising things, um, because our museum looks like a pyramid and it is inside the water. And here comes the challenge. But before that, let me tell you a few more information. Uh, it's a building by uh, the architect I.M. Pei. He's the same uh, architect of the Pyramid of the Louvre. I think we are the, his last uh, project. Uh, we are hosting more than 13,000 objects in our collections. 
focusing to Islamic art from Al Andalus, so medieval Spain, let's say, or later Spain, uh, up to China from the Muslim communities. Uh, our storages uh, consist of eight rooms, and each room is dedicated to a particular kind of a material. And this has made our life very much easier uh, into how to manage them in general. Uh, as a success story, I would say is the design of the storage itself, because it looks like a rim, and it, it, it looks like a, like a nest. And in the middle, you have the conservation laboratories and the photographic studios. This means that our storages are not exactly a dead space that somebody would expect, but it has constant movement uh, between the labs, between photography, between their location, then study rooms. So it is a live storage. It's not a storage uh, like, like a mausoleum or like a tomb that uh, some people would think in, uh, <laughs> when they say museums, in the old kind of way. Um, another success in our storages is actually the climate. Believe it or not, uh, temperature, humidity, uh, uh, temperature and humidity are, are in, in rather stable levels, especially for such a difficult location. If you think that we are a building, we're not an artificial island, we're building inside the water. Uh, a few of our daily challenges, I would say, is uh, bureaucracy is an issue. Uh, always uh, procuring, bringing things into the country. Uh, but I suppose each one of you are facing this as well, so I, I would not say it's uh, a special one. Um, pollutants can be another issue. Uh, although there are several filters from the outside to reach inside, um, we still have a lot of construction happening around. You know, the country is being prepared for uh, 2022 World Cup. Uh, and also, since it is inside the water, you would expect a lot of chlorides, a lot of uh, sea spray, uh, somehow to penetrate uh, into areas of collections. Another common problem in uh, the Gulf, and in many other countries, of course, uh, is dust. Especially when the country goes through sandstorms. Uh, they, they, these are very hard phenomena that we, we go through, and uh, this has an impact inside the museum, uh, as, uh, eventually. I would say. Uh, now, the new conditions that we are facing, uh, I would think that Qatar in terms of museums is doing rather well. Um, we have been instructed to a lockdown in March. And during this period, um, the first thing we did was turn off all the lights of the museum. So that's, I was happy to hear Anna mentioning it uh, as well. Um, in our case, we knew <laughs> how to control that, uh, but still, I have been working in this place for about uh, seven years, and I never saw the museum in darkness. And it is creepy. <laughs> um, nevertheless, we made the rotation with our team, so somebody could go there in uh, uh, twice or three times a week and go and check that everything was okay, there was nothing uh, different, nothing special. Um, we didn't have any incidences of, uh, and I have to thank God everything, everything seemed to be going um, quite well with this, with this story. Um, I will keep this presentation short because I enjoy very much the question and answer session. So I'm going to close my talk now and uh, looking forward to discussing with you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Aristo, and thanks to all the panelists for uh, keeping your opening remarks short enough so that we have enough time for discussion. Um, so I've got uh, a few questions to start off, and I think um, the audience also, they are posting a few questions, so I'll, I'll come to that in a few minutes. Um, now, I don't see um, Mr. Keita in... Uh, on screen, I guess uh, he's there, but he's got, uh, is he connected? Yep, oh, hi, thank you. We should be connected. Yeah, thank you, yeah. Yes, I'm here. So, yeah, now um, my first question, again, this is to all the panelists, if you can take uh, maybe 20, 30 seconds to answer this, that would be great. Um, often storage areas are the most overlooked areas in museums. You know, exhibitions and public access areas gets the most attention. 
How do you think we can make storage areas a priority, especially in the eyes of museum management? So maybe I, I'll, I'll again, uh, we can go in the same order. So Mr. Keita, he, you can probably, uh, you know, start off and then we'll go in the same order. We can hear you. Hello? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. Oui, mais moi, je, je peux parler? Can I speak? Yes, please. Bon, bah, en tout cas, dans notre cas, moi, je pense que pour que les zones de stockage de, euh, soient ouvertes. In our case, for these storage areas, I heard that the conditions are very different uh, depending on who is talking. For us, we need to raise awareness and inform our local visitors for them to understand what is the environment of the place that they are visiting. So the storage areas for us are open to researchers, but we have not uh, yet authorized the public to visit these areas and I think we need time and we especially need information and awareness raising for people to understand where they are and I think this will take time before we can let the public access these have access to these areas. Thank you maybe we'll Move on to Silvana. Sí, bueno, <laughs> pensé lo mismo que, que Dauda. Eh, well, I was thinking exactly along the same lines as uh, Mr. Keita. At our museum, display areas and storage areas as well have staff, qualified staff. Uh, on preventive conservation, which conduct uh, their usual work to make sure the collections are in good state. I believe that uh, good uh, communication with the authorities is key in order to conduct regular monitoring or inspections. At the moment, we're conducting weekly inspections. After each inspection, we issue a report, we take pictures, and we inform of the issues identified as well as of possible solutions. So that's why communication with the management team, it's crucial to make sure that they are aware of what the situation is like, and also that they are aware aware that uh, collections may lose value far more in storage areas than in display areas. Thanks, uh, Silvana. Could I request Anna? Yeah, very quickly. Again, I'm lucky that I'm currently in a museum where the storage area is, is really, it couldn't be much better. So, so um, for me, if I have to answer the question of, of how you make directorate aware of that, then I think it is really via uh, good communication of what the teams do and perhaps also uh, displaying and interpreting data for management to, to for them to perhaps easily digest and understand what the work involves and what it actually also uh, does for the museum. Um, yeah, keep communicating about it and 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 look at your risks and keep talking about the risks, but also how you mitigate them. Talk, keep talking about the good work that the team does. And um, if it fails, make business cases. 
is my recommendation. Thank you, Anna. Aristo? I'm pretty much covered by the previous uh, uh, answers, so I'm just going to add a little bit more to them, I hope. Um, in order for the storage to have significance and value, uh, the people who work in there will need to do that. So first of all, love, love your house. Let me put it this way. Um, I don't think it can ever be, realistically speaking, the priority, uh, but definitely once the management realized that the storage can be used more than just placing objects, they will start appreciating it more. Behind the scene visits, uh, let, let the donors come, let the sponsors come, let the, let the control public come inside, see what we're doing. As I said, let, let it be in a live space. Mm -hmm controlled because the storage is meant to be protecting the objects. So I think both of them are um, possible, but as Anna said again, uh, communicating to the, to the directors that this is a space that can be used in many ways, controlled, but it can be used, and then they appreciate it. Yeah. Thanks, Aristo. Maybe you can take off on the next uh, question. So, I mean, for each of you from the context where you are, I'm not saying just in your institution, but maybe if you pick a group of institutions, you know, that you work with around in that area, what are the biggest risks to collections in your context? So, so I start with this. We, we oh. Yeah, so if, 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 sorry, if you look at, you know, your context, so in your museum or you work with a number of museums within, you know, within your context, um, what is the biggest risk for collections there? Daniel, I understand we reverse the order now, so I'm, I'm answering. Yes, yeah, if you can start, okay. yeah. Vinod, sorry, Vinod. Um, yes, um, th 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 that's an easy and uh, hard answer on the same time. Um, as you know, uh, the Gulf here, uh, is, it has arid climate, it has extreme climate. We can have in the summer temperatures up to 55 degrees in shade. You feel your hair getting curly because of the heat. I don't know if Mr. Kita in his country is the same. Um, we have sandstorms, we have uh, extreme winds because we don't have mountains here. Um, our risk, our worries, I told you that, that the internal climate of the museum is working really well, but why? because it's mechanically supported. So our worry here is what happens at the point that the machine fails. What happens when, when, when the, the air conditions failing? Mm. This is something that we are really worried and focusing very much to, uh, to, 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 to tackle on because uh, once you have uh, heat and humidity entering suddenly uh, into the museum, you can understand there is no mercy to, the, to our objects after. Thank you so much. Thanks, Aristo. Anna? Um, yeah, what are the biggest risks? I would say the biggest risks um, to our collections come from physical movement, um, the loans that go ahead again, and the installations and deinstallations that are going on, and perhaps due to the special uh, restrictions that we now have on how we are allowed to work with how much distance between each other or, or which uh, um, personal protection we have to wear that basically hampers how we can handle the objects. And, and again, there, I would probably be most concerned about physical risk simply because we might be more likely about uh, um, yeah, be about dropping something or not handling it the way we, we would normally handle it but overall, I think that, that yeah, I, I would say that is for, for us at the moment, the biggest risk. Uh, Silvana? The main risk has to do with uh, the environment uh, where the collections are in and also with uh, controlling humidity and temperature. In Buenos Aires, it's true that we're going through longer draft periods, but it is very humid in the morning and it is very humid in the evening, but there are, there are big fluctuations in temperature and in relative humidity during the day, and that may negatively impact the collections. Also, 
the fact that museums are closed uh, means that there's a risk of vandalism. So security measures at museums need to prevent access of uh, people who may put our collections at risk. Uh, Thank you very much. I uh, completely agree with Silvana's point of view. I think climate conditions are the major risk for us and the environment is key. How do we maintain the physical integri integrity of the objects that we need to preserve? We need to make sure they don't suffer from changes in temperature. Our coworker from Qatar, Qatar said, oh, the, Mr. Dauda um, is not audible anymore. The interpreter apologizes, but she can't hear the speaker at present. Okay, we'll, 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 we'll come back um, in, in a minute. Um, I think as soon as his connections get restored. Um, let me um, ask the next question. Um, and maybe Anna, you can start with the answer for this. Um, the public have a great interest in accessing storage areas. Is this a good idea? If so, how would you make it a good visitor experience for the public and a safe environment for the collections? Yeah, this is actually one of my favorite questions because it, of course, is, has become a little bit fashionable to do that. Um, I think the first, first of all, as a museum, if we want to do that, then uh, we have to realize that it also takes resources. It is not just a matter of opening your doors. And what we actually find is that in order to make space for the public within the storage, you actually need to increase the the uh, square meters that you have available, there's actually been a study done some years ago and they say if you really want to do that, you need uh, three times as much space to actually allow people to go through your storage. And of course, the other thing that happens if you open your storage to the public is that uh, you need to keep it a lot tidier and a lot cleaner. And if you're really hoping that your visitors come back, you will also start changing that a little bit. So they become a little bit like a gallery as well. Of course, the setting is different, but you still have to care for it. So um, I think it's a great idea, but you really have to put resources um, into it if you wanted to do that. You really have to realize you're opening another gallery, even if it's not a gallery, because you have to treat it the same. Silvana, do you want to comment before we go to rest? Sí, eh, el acceso de los diferentes públicos a la access, public access to storage areas has been a source for con of concern for us and something we've been toiling with at our museum for 10 years. 10 years ago, rather, the whole storage area uh, with the ethnograph ethnographic collection was overhauled to have part of that area publicly accessible. And uh, we've done so for years following a protocol so that we have a minimum storage space for the collections. We have a control number of visitors. It's not open to the public every day. You, you have certain visiting times, but uh, we do want to have those collections available for the public. This protocol, in any case, is going to be readapted given the current circumstances. And as Anna said, resources are significant, are important, because we need to adapt storage areas and the collections. But I think that's an interesting idea to follow, to bring those collections in storage areas to the public, to bring them closer to the public. But at the moment, it's only staff members who are slowly but surely going back to museums very likely when the museum is open to the public is going to be open step by step first to regular exhibitions and finally uh, the ethnographic reserve area might be open to the public and that's what i refer to when i speak of waking collections up and for that to wake up our collections we need to readapt the environment to clean all this space in order for it to be adapted to the public. Thank, thank, thank you, Silvana. Uh, Aristo? 
uh, I'm an enthusiast of uh, accessing the storage personally. I think I have been ever since I was a kid before I even got involved into museums. Um, there, there are two cases now. So one of them is to make uh, an open storage, um, which is super interesting with uh, the pros and the cons. But I understand that most museums don't have this luxury, let's say. Um, so I will focus to having small controlled visits to the storage. Um, people are accessing the museum storage through the internet. People are accessing the museum storage through movies, through video games. You can access museum storage in video games. So what if they can do the very real thing? Uh, I also believe that allowing the public specialized groups, general groups, to know what's behind there, um, it generates interest. Uh, speaking about younger, like, like student, younger audiences, uh, like uh, uh, college students or young professionals, uh, it gives. Um, it, I think I, I think that it generates um, interest. Who can be the future professionals? As I said, um, it can uh, encourage also people to have more trust to the institution. At least I can see um, back in Greece, where, where I, I, I'm originally from, uh, there are many museums and people think that the museum is somewhere to hide things. But this is not really true. I, you know, I said with small controlled groups, you can actually um, create a better trust to the public, from the public to the museum. Um, I think this is possible, like smallly and controlled and uh, it's, 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 it's a good thing. Thank you, Aristo. Now I'm going to pick a number of questions from, from the audience. Um, meanwhile, I think everyone's, uh, uh, I think people working in the background are trying to get uh, uh, our, our fourth panelist, uh, Mr. Keita, back again. Um, hopefully, you know, he'll be able to reconnect, but we'll keep going meanwhile. Um, there's a number of questions on staff, risk to staff, when we send people into the museums, you know, to do routine checks and things like that. Uh, what's involved? Is there any kind of dialogue, discussions, risk assessment, anything done just to make sure it's safe enough? So rather than everybody answering, I would request who can just pick it up and, 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 and give your answer. Um, okay, I'm not an expert in this, um, but within three or four weeks of the pandemic starting, there has been an absolute brilliant webinar that was uh, prepared by the Canadian Conservation Institute. And they, they have done a lot of research and a lot of background information on how long might this, the virus survive on, a, on which different surfaces. And basically what I took away from that is that, that the risk is probably very small. The risk from surface contamination within storage areas is probably very small because we don't touch things. Not everyone touches objects every day. Um, so it's different from a doorknob, for example. Um, but um, I, I don't know whether you can still find it um, on the web. But if you do, I would really recommend that because it, it answers a lot of these questions. Thanks, Anna. Um... There's a, a couple of other questions again, uh, following, um, uh, you know, the same uh, management principles. There's one question that says, would all the pandemic eleven, risks, or would, would the other ten risks take care of a situation like the pandemic? I mean, Anna, you might want to have a go at it since. Yeah, can, uh, sorry, can you say it again? Because I was, the, I didn't. You broke up in between. Yes. Repeat it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so, um, you know, in terms of risk management, um, I, I guess most people are familiar with, you know, the 10 agents mm -hmm. for risk. Would you call the pandemic the 11th risk or do you think the other 10 risks would, would cover it? Do you need to now have a new risk category added? Oh, I haven't thought about this, but if you have to, if you now put me on the spot, and then I would probably say that a pandemic is a little bit like financial crisis. Is it basically acts as a magnifier on the problems that you already have? So, thing problems that you already have might 
basically uh, get uh, get into focus or might get bigger because of what you have. And that could be things like dissocia dissociation, you lose track of, um, of your objects in one way or another, or, um, you know, if you have problems in your storage areas and the pandemic comes on top and therefore you don't look at the storage areas, you see the holes in the roofs even later. I, I would, that's, I think, how I would say it. I would not add it as an 11th risk. Okay. Yeah, and I, I just noticed uh, that um, Mr. Daud Kita, he's back again. Is, is he back or is he, we lost him again? Um, maybe just, just going on, there's one more question. So I might ask either Aristo or Silvana to just comment on this. Um, in terms of collection management, uh, is there anything new you might want to add based on your experiences with this pandemic? Hello? Yeah. Hello. Hello. Hey. Hi. Uh, Aristo, do you want to have a, a go? At yes, yes, I will be quite short on it. Um, many people work from uh, their homes and uh, everything happens slower. I suppose collection management uh, is reflecting on this. Uh, I will keep it short and simple. This, this is how I see it. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Um, maybe I'll get... Um, Kita to just, you know, come back if he can hear me. Yes, because he was talking about his colleague from Qatar. <laughs> <laughs> can you hear us, Kita? Hello? Yeah, can you hear us? Yeah. I think you're on mute. I don't think we can hear you. I think well, Carlos and Isa, maybe if you can try and 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 just see how you can help to connect him. Um, the the other question is in terms of protocols for conservation. And uh, is there a a a good example of a protocol for conservation? in this time of pandemic that uh, any of the panelists could, could recommend? I mean, is there a standard one that someone's published? I know you're shaking your head. You might want to just... Uh... Yeah, I don't want to be the only one that answers all the questions. Yeah, yeah. Um, I don't know of any protocol and, and I think uh, uh, it is probably for us true what um, Aristo said earlier is that uh, things go slower, more slowly, but I don't really know of a particular protocol that has arisen as part of this pandemic. Uh, this is here. Oh, yeah. Or Aristo, you want to add to it? No, no, I, I just say I agree. Eh, yo opino que, bueno, nosotros hemos trabajado con algunos protocolos de España. We have worked with some protocols from Spain, which I think have very interesting uh, general uh, points, but I think you have to pick up protocols from different places. In Canada, everything pertaining conservation has very interesting protocols with interesting recommendations. But the Spanish Ministry of Culture, as well as the Archive Institution for Spain, have very interesting protocols which can be adaptable, at least in Argentina. Buenas. Hello? Hello? Yeah, hi, you're back. Can you hear us? Wait, was, was it good? Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. 
So maybe maybe I'll, I'll come back to one of the previous questions for the panelists and I'll ask this to uh, Mr. Um, Keita. Um, in, in terms of, uh, you know, the public, they have a lot of interest in, in accessing storage areas. I was just wondering within your context, um, you know, on museums, uh, you know, broadly within the African region, is this a good idea? If so, how would you make it a good experience for the public and a safe environment for the collection? Euh, bon, je n'ai pas bien compris la question parce que ça n'a pas été traduit, mais je, je pense que vous, vous demandez I si c'est une bonne... Si I had trouble understanding the question, but I think you were asking me if it's a good idea for the public to be able to come and visit the storage areas. Is that what you're asking? Yes. Uh, comme, comme je l'ai dit, uh, c'est un peu compliqué chez nous parce que... Déjà, la notion du musée n'est pas très bien comprise par It's a bit complicated for us because the concept of museum is not completely fully understood by the population. So we need to communicate with the public to, to bring them to visit another area of the museum, which is not the exhibition area. and to discover objects in another situation in a way that is different from an exhibition area. So what we need is time. We need time to inform, to train the public, for people who are not specialized, for them to wish to visit these areas. As I said before, the researchers can come and they often come with their students in these storage areas because they already know what they're going to be seeing. How can we bring an audience that is not specialized to visit these areas? I think that's a bit complicated for us. It's a complex question. It's, it's difficult for us to do that right now. Thank you. Um, just a reminder again, I think people who are watching this on UCAT TV on your chat screen, there's a brief survey. It'll be great if many of you can, can fill it up. Um, uh, let me read one more question from the audience. Um, this question is, I'm most curious to know if there is a business continuity plan in place as part of your risk management program for storage and collections. Does uh, anyone wants to have a go? I think if you can just unmute and speak, that'll be good. I'll just leave it open to the panelists. Anyone can. Yes, for us, that is the case. There's a business recovery and there is also a collection, collection recovery plan and they go hand in hand. Aristo, you got anything to add, Silvana? To this, uh, we, we, we do have a business plan for the development of the storage, but I'm afraid uh, we have not included the recent events yet. Right. Silvana and Kita? Estamos en plenas reuniones, justamente. We're currently holding meetings uh, within the conservation department and with authorities and uh, other team members. We're conducting online meetings to see how we're going back to uh, normal business and which issues we have to deal with. In the Southern Hemisphere, we're moving towards uh, spring and summer where we have new life, but also new uh, problems in terms of uh, insects and things like that. So we are uh, dealing with those issues at the moment. Thank you. Um, Kita, you want to add anything to it? Otherwise, I'll come to the next question, which is, uh, the question says that as such, we are already struggling to, to save or preserve everything we have in storage. This particular pandemic has made it even more difficult. Are we, say, are we having too much in a storage space and trying to save them all? 
Are the current operations sustainable? Can I answer to, to what, what I think about this? Um, or, or partially uh, another reference to, to, to Anna. Uh, no, in many ways, I think that uh, this pandemic was good for the collections. Um, <laughs> since we let them rest a little bit um, during this period. I think, I think it has, in terms of objects, only in terms of objects, it had a positive outcome. Anyone else wants to add? Sí, la realidad del hemisferio sur es diferente. In the southern hemisphere, uh, sadly, we have a different uh, reality. We don't have control environments, as I said, and we have very few control methods and only through staff members. We have uh, machines to uh, remove humidity, which are activated by people actually working in the building, not remotely. We were very much aware of what, which issues we faced in the past, uh, issues which are even starker at the moment. So I guess that's positive in a way. But in two or three months, we'll see that uh, the collection here has been, has suffered a negative impact because of the pandemic. As for the storage areas, I think we should preserve the whole heritage, the whole set of cultural objects and giving priority of the mo to the most vulnerable objects with uh, stricter control and monitoring measures. Thank you, Silva. Mr. Dauda Kita, do you want to comment on that? Do you think we are, we are saving too much, keeping too much in our storage areas? Uh, si je comprends bien, il s'agit de demander si on, on conserve beaucoup d'objets. Uh, You're asking me if we're storing too many things in the storage yeah. areas, yeah. right? Yeah. Uh, I don't have the translation, says the speaker. Yes, about 80% of our objects are in storage areas, and we can't uh, show everything in our exhibition rooms because they're not big enough. Sorry, the sound cut off at the end of the speaker's intervention. I think he's having technical problems with... Um, with uh... Yes, I agree. There are a lot of objects which are stored, which is normal. We can't show everything. And the objects which are not exhibited have to be kept safe. About 80% of our objects are in storage areas. We also have temporary exhibitions from time to time. We also have temporary exhibitions from time to time, and during these exhibitions we can show objects which are not part of the permanent collection. We also provide objects on loan, and we send our objects to many different countries in the world, which also gives us the possibility to exhibit our objects elsewhere. But yes, I completely agree. Most of our collections are in storage areas. Yeah. Thank you. We are nearly coming to the, the end of the webinar. So I'm just um, reminding everyone, uh, please do fill the survey. I think you've got to cut and, 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 and paste it and, and, and then, then fill it um, uh, in, in terms of the process. So in, in closing, what I would like to do is give each one of you, in closing, what I'd like to do is give each one of you about 30 seconds to make your final comments. If you got anything particular, any takeaway messages, it'll be good if you can share it. If there's anything particular you just realized you know, it's very important, uh, you know, as you went through this whole pandemic period in terms of collections and storage, uh, you know, if you want to share it. So maybe, Silvana, do you want to start and then we'll just go to the others? 
Sí. Eh, Thank you. I think it's important that uh, the public, museum users, and staff members can access safely to the museums. That's why we need protocols. Some of them have already been drafted. Some of them are ongoing. And we need to know how to face the consequences and the impact uh, of the pandemic on our collections, particularly in museums located in countries in which the environment control is not possible to do remotely. And something I couldn't say earlier is that social networks are a perfect way to establish a link between people and the collections to continue running activities related to the museum, continue engaging the public. But uh, it's not the same as visiting the museum personally and access to the collection need to be, needs to be ensured and needs to be safe. I hope it will be sooner rather than later. Thank you. Who would like to go next? I think if I had to add final thoughts, then my final thought would be don't forget about the people. Don't forget about the staff that actually work with these collections, because we had to realize that they all have to, they all go through their own uh, particular uh, uh, smaller or bigger crises, perhaps with loved ones um, or people they care for. And um, sometimes, the collection or the, the concern of the museum is not everything. Thank you, Anna. Aristo? Uh, nicely said from both of the ladies. Uh, again, for me to add something, uh, something more rather than... Uh, um, there, there's no point of the collection if there's no people around it. So it's, it's a circle, the, the, the people care for the collection, the collections giving to the people. Thank you, Arista. Um, Kita, do you have any final closing comments you want to share? Can you hear us, Kita? You just have to unmute, I think. Oui, oui, je vous très bien. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah. Do you have any final thoughts you have on this whole thing? I know if you have any final thoughts, it would be good if you can share that. What I would like to say is that I'm really happy to participate in this uh, meeting where we were able to share experiences and the problems, uh, the challenges, in particular be able to exchange with my colleague from Argentina and see that we have practically the same problems. So I think it's really interesting to be able to speak together and try and find solutions together. An object which is in a stored area, if it's not uh, seen by uh, visitors, it does not exist in a way. So we have to think about how we can show these objects to the public. And as I said, uh, while we protecting these objects and if without these objects, museums have uh, no reason to exist. And I think that's uh, what is important. And thank you very much for this uh, very fruitful exchange. Thank you. Thank you so much. I think it's well put together and well, well summarized, Silvana, you want to add something? Silvana, were you, were you trying to say something? Sorry. Sí, disculpe, una sola cosa. Yes, just a final remark, please. I believe that if we don't conserve our cultural heritage, we will have nothing to offer and nothing to display. I think that's uh, the core of our work. We work for the public, but we need to know exactly how we're going to face conservation issues over the next months. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So 
Thank you very much. It's been uh, a great panel, uh, a great uh, audience. Thank you so much for all the questions. Please do not forget to fill the survey. Um, again, I think you got, you have to cut and paste and then, then fill that, that particular survey. Uh, just as a reminder, the next webinar on digitization is on the 21st of October at 3 p.m. Paris time. So put that, please put that in your diary. Uh, so before I say goodbye, let me thank uh, the panelists again, Kita, Silvana, Anna, and Aristo. Thank you so much for coming time and sharing your knowledge. And, and thank you again to ICOM for, um, you know, putting this whole series together. Thank you to all the people behind the scenes um, who have made this possible, uh, all the ICOM staff. Thank you. Thank you.